Good evening, everyone. My name is Jay Parsons, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's webinar titled Using EBVs to Achieve Your Breeding Goals. This evening webinar is brought to you by the Let's Grow Committee of the American Sheep Industry Association. We'd like to thank them for their support and encourage you to visit their website to learn more about the American sheep industry and the large volume of services and resources available to help you be successful in the sheep business. That URL is www.sheepusa.org. Now, before we begin, I'd like to inform our listeners that this uh, webinar is being recorded and all registrants will receive a follow-up email within the next 48 hours with a direct link to the recording, as well as a link to access the slides used in this evening's presentation. There are also links uh, posted on the ASI website at sheepusa.org under the Let's Grow Committee materials. We're slated here for a presentation of about 45 to 50 minutes with about 20 minutes for questions to follow it. Uh, feel free to submit your questions as we go. You don't have to wait till the end and let them all pile up and try to remember them. But as uh, we're going through the presentation, feel free to type them into the question dialog box at the bottom uh, of your control panel. I'll be monitoring those questions throughout the presentation and then uh, moderating the question and answer session that follows and uh, present those to Dr. Nodder. It is now my pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Nodder. This evening's uh, speaker is Dr. David Nodder, who's a professor emeritus in the Department of Animal and Poultry Sciences at uh, Virginia Tech University. Dr. Nodder is one of the world's experts in animal breeding and genetics. He's also very highly respected uh, as a scholar and a speaker within the sheep industry, and we're very lucky to have him here this evening uh, to make this presentation, and I want to thank him in advance for uh, taking the time to be with us. And Dr. Nodder, the stage is yours. Well, thank you, Jay. Uh, I will take your word for it that there's a group of people out there that I'm about to talk to, and so now my challenge is to sort of create this alternative reality that pictures all of you out there smiling and nodding in agreement with everything I say, and I can work on trying to continue and maintain that alternate reality at least up until the questions. Uh, tonight, our plan is a little different. I want we often have focused in these sorts of webinars on how to get EBVs, how to create breeding value predictions. Tonight, I want to flip that focus. I want to ask the question of what do you do with the EBVs once you have them? Because that's really the exciting part. It's not the work you have to do to get them. It's the power and control over your breeding program it gives you once you have them. I think too often breeders enter NSIP expecting that having EBVs will cause customers to beat a path to your door. It will cause them to pay more for your sheep. That might happen, but at first it probably won't. It's going to be your job, rather, to get customers to beat a path to your door because your sheep work for them. And EBVs are a tool that you can use to do a better job of making sheep that will work for your customers. Along the way, you can educate those customers and help them understand that it's the EBVs that are the tool you use to breed better sheep and that they can use to buy better sheep. This slide overviews the main traits that are reported by National Sheep Improvement Program. Uh, we've got about 15 or 20 if we look at each individual trait, and some of them have direct effects of the lamb and maternal effects of his mother. Uh, so we've got quite a range of traits that we're going to touch on uh, in groups tonight. If you want to really get impressed, Lamb Plan in Australia expands that list of traits to 85 different things that you can, in theory, get EBVs for. So if you thought your current list was hard to make sense of, think about that list. Uh, however, a lot of those traits are manifestations of the same thing. Uh, so we have adult weights on two-year-old ewes and three-year-old ewes and four-year-old ewes, uh, rather than uh, 85 unique traits. We're going to start with the body weight traits. Uh, because those are the traits that have been the key element of genetic evaluation in sheep since the very beginning. 
of genetic evaluation programs. We have four that most of you are familiar with, birth weights, weaning weights, both of which have an impact from the genetics of the lamb and also from the genetics of the mother as they influence the uterine environment for the gestating lamb and as milk production and other maternal characteristics influence the weaning weight of the lamb. We have post weaning and yearling weights that have more to do with marketing and recently we've done a lot of talking about collecting hoggett weights. For those of you who may not know, hoggett being an Australian New Zealand term for an animal at about 18 months of age. So we see the yearling weights and the hoggett weights if we start recording those more regularly is giving us a way to see what the adult weights of these ewes are likely to be. Now if we wanted to create an ideal growth curve for a lamb, that lamb would be born with a modest birth weight. He'd be big enough to get up, nurse, and thrive, but not too big for his mother to deliver. That lamb needs then to grow like a house on fire until sale time, either as a feeder or a finished lamb. And for the industry, he needs to keep growing until he go the day he goes to market. If it's a ewe lamb, she needs to get plenty big enough to breed when she's seven or eight months of age. She needs to get plenty big enough to raise her first lamb and occasionally to raise a couple lambs. Growth then needs to flatten off so the adult maintenance costs stay low, condition is maintained, and the animal can thrive on pasture and range. We talk a lot about big ewes being high maintenance ewes and taking a lot of feed, and that's true. But the more important issue may be that big ewes also are harder and have a more difficult time taking care of themselves when pasture gets short, when they've got a lot walk a long way to find feed. We haven't talked about birth weights much in these presentations about NSIP, and there's a good reason for that. It's because many of us come at the birth weight situation from a beef, beef cattle viewpoint. The idea that birth weights are generally too big, birth weights need to be reduced so we can avoid lambing difficulty. But the truth of that matter is actually a little different. I can find at least half a dozen slides with the same message I have on this one. I happened to choose this one because it was data I knew quite a bit about from the U.S. Sheep Experiment Station. We've looked at the probability or the risk of a lamb dying within three days of birth. Now, if you look at the arrow, that arrow corresponds to the average birth weight in this white-faced ewe flock of about nine pounds. And the risk ratio out there on the left of one for that lamb says this is our baseline lamb. As you move left, as that lamb goes from four kilos, about nine pounds, to three kilos, about six and a half pounds, the risk of that lamb dying in the first three days of life triples, goes from one to three. On the other hand, when you go to the right, the risk doesn't go up for quite a long time. As we get those lambs from nine pounds to 11 pounds to 13 pounds, the actual risk of losing that lamb just continues to slowly go down by about 50%. And not until those lambs get really heavy, and even not always then, do we start to see the death losses that we often believe will accompany heavyweight lambs. We're out there to 17 or 18 pounds before these curves really curl up. And this is, again, typical, certainly, of sheep that produce reasonable numbers of twins and occasional triplets. We have a lot more problems with underweight lambs than we do with overweight lambs. And having our lamb weights go up a bit from the average is usually a good thing. The only exceptions being breeds that really have a lot of singles and breeds that in situations where we're breeding ewe lambs. So our birth weight EBVs are not really something we need to pay a lot of attention to unless we're getting a lot of underweight lambs that are dying or unless we're getting some really huge lambs that are having trouble getting out. So birth weight EBV is the first step in the growth curve. We don't probably need to be spending a lot of time on unless we have a problem. Now remember, I said growth then needs to flatten off so the adult maintenance costs stay low. 
And this is the hard one. Big sheep tend to be big forever. Little sheep tend to be little forever. And if we don't pay attention, given the history of our selection in the sheep industry, our ewes are almost certainly going to get bigger. And for some of you in some places, it's not hard to get ewes that are maybe too big. If we want to change growth patterns, if we want to get a lot of growth in the lamb without getting a lot of size in the ewe, we've really got only two strategies. One of them doesn't have anything to do with EBVs. It's crossbreeding mating big lean rams to smaller, easy keeping ewes. The alternative is changing the maternal weaning weight EBVs to get more milk in the ewe flock, to get the lambs heavier, not due to being bigger at adulthood, not being more genetics for growth, but because they have a mother who's giving them more milk. These are about the only way we can do much with a growth curve. And increasing milk production may create its own problems, since both increasing adult size and increasing milk production increase nutrient requirements. But I would say for most breeds in the U.S. that we have a lot more potential problems from oversized ewes than we do from ewes that give too much milk. This graph of genetic correlations among weight traits gives us a, a picture of how, why it's so hard to change this growth curve. These are weaning weights, post weaning weights, yearling weights, and hogget weights. These numbers on the diagonal are the correlations genetically between the adjacent weights. So the genetic correlation between weaning weight at 60 days or so and post weaning weight at four to eight months is almost 90%. You can't have big lambs at weaning that don't continue to grow. And when people ask, should I place emphasis on weaning weight or post weaning weight, it really doesn't matter. Selection for early growth gives you selection for early growth all the way through. We also see that selection for post weaning weight is going to produce heavier yearlings. Selection for yearling weight is going to produce heavier hoggets. Uh, it's pretty much unavoidable to break that in two. The numbers in the body of the table are the numbers we currently use in NSIP, but some data from Montana State University that Randy Borg and Rodney Cott and I worked on a few years ago suggests that these numbers may be conservative. Those data with Targhee sheep at, my, at uh, near Bozeman suggest that by the time we get our weaning and post weaning weights, those big lambs have are going to be big ewes no matter what we do. And by the time we take yearling weights and hogget weights, those weights are strongly predictive of the adult size of the ewes. And we're going to be thinking about that a little more as we think about how to get more weaning weights, more post weaning weights, maybe a little more yearling weight, not a lot more hogget weight, and try and avoid getting these really, really big adult ewes. Another set of traits that takes some, some thought and thinking are the number of lambs born, number of lambs weaned EBVs. These are designed to provide genetic evaluations of litter size and lamb survival. These are traits that are extremely important economically. They're low in heritability, but they've got a lot of variation, and our breeders who have committed to improving these traits are showing that they will respond to selection. And certainly the number of lambs weaned is one of the most important traits uh, in sheep production, and it's one that NSIP has placed a lot of emphasis on. Now when we start looking at EBVs for number of lambs born and number of lambs weaned, and those are expressed as the percentage lambs born per 100 ewes lambing, the percentage lambs weaned per 100 ewes lambing, we've got to recognize that we aren't looking for maximums anymore. We might be looking for rams with the highest post weaning weight EBVs, but we're not looking for rams with the highest number of lambs born EBVs. We need to optimize rather than maximize those EBVs. Many breeders talk about wanting to have all twins, but we don't get all twins. If you want the frequency of triplets in your flock to stay low, 5% or less, then the frequency of twin births can rarely exceed 65% on a whole flock basis. 
your ewe lambs are going to have mostly singles. A fair number of your two-year-olds are going to have singles. If you want to keep the triplet frequency low, it's really hard to get more than 65% twin births. And if you want to kind of go all in and wean a 200% lamb crop, which we talk about a lot in the sheep industry, you're going to have to drop at least two and a quarter lambs per ewe lambing to get that done. And that's a lot more sobering than thinking about just weaning all twins. Everybody's got their own optimum number of lambs born, depending on whether you're in Nevada or Iowa or Virginia, depending on how you feel about triplets. I always enjoy listening to breeders talk about triplets because some of them talk about what a great opportunity and they somehow keep most of those triplets alive and they somehow get them to market. And the ones who get triplets and kind of shake their head about, oh, this is a problem, those lambs don't last very long. Neither one of those breeders is right or wrong. They've just got different priorities about how many lambs they want to have. And it's important that we recognize this. Now, EBVs are not great at moving number of lambs born toward an optimum. We have to help do that. And we do that by saying and thinking about whether you really want more lambs born. And if you really don't, then number of lambs born is not a trait you're going to pay much, if any, attention to. And when you see a ram with a number of lambs born EPD of minus 3 or minus 4, and he's otherwise a ram that you think you got or would like, he's going to be fine for you. If you think you need to be moving toward that 200% lamb crop, then you're going to start looking for lambs with high EBVs and number of lambs born, and particularly number of lambs weaned, because number of lambs weaned EBV keeps those ewes honest. Can't just have triplets, you got to keep them alive. Another trait that's been very important in keeping the fitness of our animals up has been the fecal egg count EBV. And I know we've got a reasonable number of Katahdin breeders in the audience tonight. I also know we've got a lot of breeders who are not Katahdin breeders. So I'm going to talk about fecal egg counts in a sort of general way. And that's because I know Katahdin breeders can talk about this trait all night. Currently, the fecal egg count EBVs used to select for parasite resistance are being used almost exclusively by Katahdin. But there's increasing interest in other breeds, and I know we have Polypay, Suffolk, and Dorset breeders who are getting fecal egg count EBVs. We've been measuring fecal egg counts in our Suffolk rams at Virginia Tech for the last three or four years. And I can say at this point that genetic improvement and parasite resistance is possible for any sheep breed and probably for any goat breed if we take the trouble to measure the fecal egg counts and use them in our breeding program. Now, Katahdin's, as a hair sheep cross, had a head start. They were indeed in the best position to capitalize on fecal egg count EBVs because they had a relatively high level of innate resistance coming in from their hair sheep contribution. Meaningful progress in other breeds will be slower, and those of you in other breeds will have to decide what the value of parasite resistance is to you. But if you see value in breeding Suffolk's and Polypes and Dorset's that have parasite resistance, these fecal egg count EBVs do provide a tool to do that. It takes a little more work and it takes a little more thought. Uh, worms, parasites are a regional problem and they're a seasonal problem. There's more investment in collecting the data. You have to get a fecal sample from the rectum of each lamb. You have to ship that sample to a lab for evaluation. And you have to pay for that service. But that's really not a lot different than what you do for wool samples that you send off for OFTA or fiber diameter measures. It's not a lot different than what you do for ultrasound when you pay an ultrasound technician to come in and scan your lambs. It's simply a matter of deciding whether the benefit is there for you. There's more effort involved in scheduling. You can't measure parasite resistance if you don't have parasites. The worms have to be there. You have to wait until your animals are being challenged. 
but you can't push that challenge too far or you'll start to lose lambs. So there is some juggling involved, there is some care involved, and this is why this is one of our most promising traits for using genomics to try and select animals that are parasite resistant based on their genome, not based on fecal egg counts. We're not close to that yet, frankly, but we are moving in that direction, we are asking that question. So for now, if you're interested in parasite resistance, this is a great tool. Find your Katahdin friends who are doing these EBVs. This is a really quick look at how we do them, measuring fecal egg samples about the time the lambs need their first deworming in the spring, and again late in the summer when fecal egg counts and parasite challenge tends to be maximum. This late summer challenge is the one I would recommend for those of you with breeds other than Katahdin. For Katahdin, we've documented that both of these samples, early and late in life, are useful. Moving on to some other traits. Uh, a couple things we need to talk about, the fleece weight traits, greasy fleece weight, fiber diameter, and staple length, which are fairly standard EBVs in NSIP. But since partnering with LAMPLAN, we can also provide EPDs for all the traits in the OFTA fiber profiles. So we can provide you with a very comprehensive genetic evaluation of fleece value. On the meat side, ultrasound fat and muscle depth, again, an important pair of traits that are getting a lot of interest in terminal sires. Both of these kinds of traits, though, are really hard to work with in isolation. And what I'm going to try to do now is to put some perspective on how these traits fit with other traits to maximize profit in a commercial sheep operation. So, for example, uh, wool production, separate from meat production, is just not in the cards anymore. Animals have to be multi-purpose producers of lamb and wool. Great carcasses only fit together with fast-growing, high-value lambs. So we have to put the value of ultrasound fat and muscle together with the value of growth and the value and the uh, rewards and penalties that the market is giving you. So let's talk about how to do that. And we're going to do that by bringing up the topic of developing indexes and breeding objectives. And in an EBV world, those things are effectively the same. This uh, equation at the top of the page is our Targi Western Range Index. This is probably the most comprehensive index we have produced in NSIP. Uh, it was done mainly by Randy Borg as a part of his master's thesis uh, with a lot of help from Rodney Cott and the Targi breeders in Montana and others. This is an equation that puts weightings on each of the EBVs, including EBVs for post-weaning weight, which is the 120-day weaning weight in the Western Range world. So this is really the 120-day weaning weights. Maternal weaning weight effects, the milk production of the ewe, yearling weight, yearling fleece weight, yearling fiber diameter, and the number of lambs born per ewe mated, uh, sorry, per ewe lambing. This equation is designed to predict uh, net receipts, income over expenses per ewe in the flock. And it provides a way we put these different values together. Uh, if, we look at, whoops, if we look at these, we see some of the reasons why we need this tool and tools like it. Post weaning weight and yearling weight have a very high genetic correlation, 0.65. And we've already seen that high yearling weights mean big use. Fleece weight and fiber diameter have an antagonism. Coarse fleeces tend to be heavy. Heavy fleeces tend to be coarse. Fine fleeces tend to be light. The antagonism that wool producers have struggled with from day one. Number of lambs born has some small antagonisms with fleece production. 
Sheep with a high genetic merit for prolificacy tend to produce a little lighter fleeces. They tend to produce a little coarser fleeces. We also think, have said, that the, the prolificacy of the ewe and her maternal ability is fairly much independent, but some of the work from Montana suggests there may be of a bit of a antagonism here too. High milk production ewes maybe have smaller litters. So trying to manage these antagonisms, large and small, lead to some interesting things in this index. The most interesting one for a lot of our breeders is we have placed negative emphasis on yearling weight. And we have done that in order to control the adult weights of the ewes. Now, yeah, this was kind of traumatic. We had breeders telling us, you know, I think my ewes are getting too big. I'm worried about my ewes getting too big. Well, this is how you keep your ewes from getting too big. We've still got a big positive slug on post-weaning weight here. We still want lambs to grow. We just want to use this antagonism between the sign on post-weaning weight and yearling weight to keep those adult weights from going out of control. And that's about all this index does. It controls and moderates adult use size. The other thing we did was to recognize that the number of lambs born dominates this index. At the time this index was created, the best opportunity to increase profitability was to get more lambs on the ground. So that was a dominant fact. This shows graphically the different traits, weaning weight, maternal milk, yearling weight, fleece weight, fiber diameter, staple length, which had only a small net effect, and the percent lamb crop weaned, the number of lambs born. We see that relative returns from a comparable increase in percent lamb crop were about 6%. A similar increase in weaning weight increased returns about 3%. And reducing yearling weight, or increasing yearling weight, was actually going to cost us money, reducing returns about 2%. So this was designed to be a comprehensive index predicting net, costs, net returns above costs. To give you another argument for why the adult weight, this AWT, needs to be controlled, we'll go back to some more data from Montana State, again done by Randy Borg with help from Rodney Cott and I, looking at the relationships between adult weights and some other traits. Now, fortunately, number of lambs born does tend to be a little higher for bigger sheep. They have a few more ewes, lambs born. But if we look at measures of stability, how long those ewes stay in the flock, their productive life, we see a different story. This stability measure is the probability a ewe that's present in the flock at two years of age is still there at six. So the probability she'll hang on till she's a six-year-old. This is a similar measure, her productive life in months how long between the time she enters the flock and she dies or is culled. We see that almost all these numbers are negative. Bigger ewes have more trouble staying in the flock, they have shorter productive lives, and we've already made the point that they cost more to maintain. So we've got a pretty strong argument for not letting these adult weights get out of control. At the time Randy did his work, we also recognized that increasing frock pro prolificacy is not a forever thing. This graph shows the relationship between the number of lambs born per ewe lambing and the weight of lamb weaned in terms of kilograms per ewe. And we'll focus on the low triplet survival curve because it's the more realistic one. And this curve assumes that about 50% of all triplet lambs do not make it to weaning. We see that when your prolificacy for your ewes is in the 150 to 190 percent range, getting more lambs is a pretty good thing. You're replacing singles with twins. But when you start to get to the 180, 190, 200 percent lamb drops, 
the value of getting more lambs goes down because now you start drop replacing twin lambs, most of which stay alive, with triplet lambs, many of which don't. And so we see that these indexes are not static, they're dynamic. And in fact, the Targi breed has moved along this curve since this index was done. And we're going to talk about, as we close up tonight, whether there might be a time when we should revise this index to meet the realities of more prolific sheep. As I said, this is a dynamic thing. It's a tool. I'm going to jump through this very quickly. I want to move now to some of our terminal sire breeds because we do have uh, various terminal sire indexes. And again, we're managing antagonisms. These are the genetic correlations between post-weaning weight and post-weaning eye muscle depth, growth and muscle. And that's a pretty substantial negative correlation in the Suffolk. It's hard to get more weight and more muscle, at least as we and lamb plan define muscle, which is the size of the loin eye at a constant body weight of about 120 pounds. Uh, it's a little less difficult to get high growth and large muscle size in breeds like Katahdin and Polype because there's been less selection for extreme body weights. But we need to ask ourselves, how do we go about identifying the kinds of terminal sires we want to use for breeding? We were fortunate that we had a really nice data set from the U.S. Sheep Experiment Station where sires of four different breeds were all mated to Rambouillet ewes and produced F1 progeny. Those lambs were scanned on a repeated basis with loin muscle area and depth measured every two to three weeks. All the weather lambs were slaughtered and their muscle depth and muscle eye size was calculated. And we were able to ask the question, what influences carcass value, CVAL? And we did that two ways. One, the hanging carcass, and the other one after trimming all the excess fat off the high value cuts. So this is our trimmed carcass value as it's controlled by the off-test body weight of the lamb, the ultrasonic back fat thickness, and the ultrasonic loin muscle depth. And we see that body weight and ultrasonic loin muscle depth have strong positive impacts on carcass value, ultrasonic back fat, reducing fat in these already lean breeds. And remember, these were our classic sire breeds, doesn't do much a small advantage to reducing carcass fat in these crossbred lambs. We use this as an opportunity to ask what would be the value of using different kinds of Suffolk rams in a crossbreeding program like this. We went to the NSIP website. We identified rams in the top 10% for post weaning weight, the bottom 10% for back fat thickness, and the top 10% for loin eye depth. We compare those to rams in the 50th percentile, average Suffolk sheep. Lambs in the top 10% were 10 pounds heavier in terms of their EBVs for post weaning weight. They had just a tiny bit less fat, uh, about a hundredth of an inch or 33 hundredths of a millimeter. And they had 1.4 millimeters more loin eye depth, corresponding to about an extra two tenths of a square inch in loin eye area. Now, based on the equation on the previous slide, showing the impact of these measurements on value, we would predict that using our Suffolk ram in the top 10% of the breed for growth would in give you an extra $600 compared to an average ram. A Suffolk ram in the top 10% of the breed for loin eye size would be with you lambs worth an extra $97 compared to an average lamb. That's based on 100 lambs from that sire. A ram in the bottom 10% with the leanest 10% for back fat thickness, almost a wash. Essentially, all of these lambs were yield grade twos and threes, 
no one was likely to pay you much more for terminal sires that were a little bit leaner. Terminal sires that grow faster were worth a lot more, and if we look at the sale results from the center of the nation this year, we saw some of this happening. Rams with more muscling had a solid additional value as well. So we made some indexes. We asked, how would we select terminal sires? If you're going out to buy a set of sires of the Suffolk, the Columbia, the Texel, the Shropshire, the Dorset, the Hamp breeds, how would you use EBVs to pick the sheep that have the most value for top crossing on white faced maternal ewes? Now we looked at different indexes depending on animals killed at a constant time, a constant weight, or a constant fat. The details are a little different, but the basic numbers are all the same. Post weaning weight gets a nice solid plus. EBVs are given a little negative weight for fat. Ultrasonic loin muscle depth gets a nice solid plus. But the genetic correlation among these indexes are all approaching one. These indexes all do about the same thing. So pick whichever one you like. You'll pick the same rams and you will pick rams that grow. Because the genetic correlation between these fairly comprehensive indexes and the post weaning weight EBV is 96%. The easiest way to add value to a terminal sire is to make it grow. Because there is so much more variability to be acted upon in post weaning weight than in loin muscle depth. We often talk about if we could increase loin eye depth by an inch, if we could go from two to three square inches. Well, I'm here to tell you, you can't do that. There aren't rams out there within a breed that will let you go from two to three square inches. You can go from about two or from about two and a half to about two six or two seven. And that's about as far as you can go. But you can add 10 pounds in terms of, of EBVs for body weight. Now, we recognize that selection isn't current. Selection's for the future. And sometime in the future, we may care a lot more about muscling, and we may care a lot more about fat than we do today. And our markets might start rewarding us for fat, reduced fat and increased muscle more than they do today. So we thought we'd see what that might mean, because sheep breeders have to work two generations in the future, because that's when your breeding decisions will bear fruit. So we arbitrarily said, let's increase the importance of reducing fat depth by four times. Let's really put a serious premium on yield grade twos. And let's increase the impact of increasing muscle depth by double. Let's build a grid that does care about larger loin eyes. And we produced a high quality index with those assumptions, and it does look a little different. There's more emphasis on ultrasound back fat. There's more emphasis, uh, sorry, there's more emphasis on back fat. There's less emphasis on post weaning weight. But you know what? The correlation between these indexes is still 95%. And post weaning weight still accounts for 88% of the variation in this index. So, folks, until our market demands leanness beyond what we have today available in our terminal sires, and until our market rewards us for bigger loin eyes, most of our opportunities for selecting on terminal sires is going to sit right here with improving post weaning growth. The Carcass Plus Index, which comes out of Lamb Plan and which all of you have access to when you download your EBVs, although every, they aren't all, all published, is a tool that we have today for selection. And the correlation between Lamb Plan's Carcass Plus and our high quality index is 96%. Carcass Plus works. For those of you who believe that greater premiums for leanness and muscle are important. But for those of you who work in the market today, and those of you who are buying rams for crossbreeding today, growth is probably undervalued 
and post weaning weight is our dominant EBV. Now the rest of the time, which is getting a little bit short, I want to spend on the maternal indexes. Uh, Polype and Katahdin both have maternal indexes designed to predict U productivity, designed to predict genetic merit for pounds of lamb weaned per U lambing. These maternal indexes were designed for maternal breeds to be used mainly in crossing with terminal sires. They do not directly consider post weaning growth and carcass merit. So by implication, these are breeds that are predominantly ewe breeds. The traits in there, weaning weight, maternal weaning weight, number of lambs weaned, and number of lambs born. And while the coefficients are slightly different, they're very similar, and number of lambs weaned, as for the uh, Western Range Index, is the dominant EBV. Everybody gets a little uh, suspicious about this negative emphasis on number of lambs born, and that's really fairly easy to understand. Two things to point out. First, this coefficient, 035, is a whole lot smaller than this one. And what happens when we factor in this small negative effect of number of lambs born, it says when we get two lambs weaned, we're happier if we got that because the ewe had two and didn't lose any than if the ewe had three and lost one. So it's a small penalty for ewes that don't keep all their lambs alive. But I can assure you a ewe that has three and keeps them all alive is going to be better by a lot than a ewe that has uh, two and keeps them all alive. Now, this ewe productivity indexes have gotten a lot of use in the polype and the Katahdin breed. They've got some really strong supporters, and I guess I would be one of them. But there is a need to think more about lamb post weaning performance in the maternal breeds. And we've had a lot of conversation over the last two or three years about how to do this. Doing a proper selection index, like the Western Range Index, is a big job. But there are a number of breeders who would like to have post weaning growth and scanning data added to these ewe productivity indexes. And Katahdin flocks would also like to incorporate fecal egg count EBVs into their selection indexes. Uh, we're not going to deal with that one tonight because that's a particularly tough one. Maybe that's a subject of another webinar for the Katahdin folks someday. If we want to combine new productivity and lamb post weaning growth in the maternal breeds, we can start with our ewe productivity index as our best indicator of ewe value, and we can think about adding post weaning weight or carcass plus as an indicator of lamb value, and create an index that looks something like this, ewe productivity, the ewe productivity index, and the lamb post weaning weight EBV tied together and weighted to optimize returns to the flock. The challenge, what is the appropriate emphasis to place on ewe productivity and post weaning weight? Well, we've done a little what if calculations on this and I'll share them with you tonight. There's still work to do, but I think they'll be interesting to some of you. I'm going to define a maternal breed as one that's used mainly in crossing with terminal sires, or at least a maternal ram is one whose daughters are being used for crossbreeding. A dual purpose ram is one whose progeny are being produced in a purebred commercial flock, a flock that is using a single breed for their commercial production. We have plenty of those around in Targi, Katahdin, Rambouillet, and Dorset. Now many of us would argue that terminal sire crossing is better, but I'm not here to decide what's better. I'm here to help you deal with what you've decided to do. If you have a true maternal breed, then I think you productivity is a pretty good index. But for a dual purpose breed, you productivity and post weaning weight both influence value, and we might need to figure out how to put those both together in a, in a simple way. I've distinguished between dual purpose and maternal flocks because in a dual purpose flock, in a flock that is using a single breed 
about 85% of the lambs produced in that flock get sold, with only about 15% retained as replacements. For a maternal flock, where there's a lot of terminal sire crossing, only about 20% of those purebred ewe lambs get sold. We add those to the weathers, and only about 60% of the total lambs born from the maternal ram get sold. Each of the replacement ewes goes on to produce crossbred market lambs. Now, I'm going to make an initial assumption. I'm going to assume that increasing ewe size has no direct positive impact on net returns. Bigger ewes are not more efficient. Whatever increased lamb value you get from having a bigger ewe is probably wiped out by the extra feed she eats and her reduced stability. So the value of including post-weaning performance in your breeding objective comes only for the lambs you sell for market out of that ram. Whoops. So if we think about dual purpose flocks, where a lot of surplus weathers, or a lot of surplus sheep are getting sold, some fairly simple calculations suggest that a reasonable index would be ewe productivity plus three times post weaning weight. The ewe productivity EBV plus three times the post weaning weight EBV. That's putting about equal emphasis on ewe productivity and post weaning weight. And that's a pretty good strategy for incorporating growth and post weaning performance into your dual purpose flock. A maternal flock that sells only breeding rams, the optimum index is more like this because you're not doing dual purpose production. A lot of your ewes are getting bred to terminal sires. You're only interested in emphasizing post weaning weight for the lambs that are sold uh, out of that maternal sire. So post weaning weight gets only about 40% as much emphasis as ewe productivity. In a maternal flock that's selling breeding rams and selling replacement ewes, where you don't have very many surplus market animals to sell, that index looks more like this weight of post weaning. So what we've got is an array of indexes that go all the way from heavy emphasis on maternal and terminal sire crossbreeding, which is just kind of putting a tweak on the growth, up to a dual purpose flock where you might have purebred polypay rams or purebred katahdin rams or purebred texel lambs to market, and where you might put essentially equal emphasis on ewe productivity and post weaning weight. Now let's apply some of this to the Targi Western Range Index. You wool guys have been sitting back there. I don't know if you're typing or not, but you're not breaking in, so you've been patient. So let's talk about the Targi Western Range Index and how we might make it better. Well, we've probably increased genetic merit for lambing rate in the Targi to the point we can back off on the emphasis on number of lambs born. And I think we can back off by 25 to 50 percent on number of lambs born. Uh, keep the triplets under control. Push a little less hard to get more lambs on the ground. We can potentially add some emphasis on post weaning weight we can potentially focus a little less on, year, on negative impacts on yearling weight and put our emphasis on controlling ewe size on hogget weights. Now, if we're going to do that, you have to start weighing your ewe lambs at first breeding. And you have to start putting that weight into NSIP. You can do that. And if you do that, I'm pretty sure you'll do a better job of managing this antagonism between rapid early growth, reasonable yearling weights, and controlled adult weights. These weights are for the dual purpose flock, the breeder who is selling only Targi market lambs. And in addition, it's probably for the Targi breeder who is 
and is continuing to own those lambs to harvest. Because if you're selling feeder lambs, you've got to have a really astute buyer who's going to pay you extra for the lambs with that growth potential unless you continue to own them. If you're terminal, using terminal sires, if you're breeding a fairly large number of your ewes or your customers are breeding a fairly large number of their ewes to terminal sires, I'm reducing the emphasis on post-weaning weight. I might keep yearling weight out of there entirely, but I'm continuing to place negative emphasis on hogget weight to control adult size. And if you're not going to measure hogget weight, I'm going to continue to place negative weight on yearling weight. So we're going to have an opportunity for a lot of targi breeders to talk about this in a month or so, you know, a few weeks at the Miles City Ram Sale. Hopefully this will give you something to think about. In conclusion, let's also look at how this might apply to western range flocks producing fine wools. We've got a nice group of new enrollees in NSIP from the Rambouillet and the Australian Merino world. They're going to be asking whether this Western Range Index works for them. And here's some things I would say to those breeders who are trying to juggle fine wool production with high levels of lamb production. I don't think we're ready to reduce the importance of prolificacy, number of lambs born and number of lambs weaned, unless you're already seeing more than 4 or 5% triplets. Until that happens, I'm going to kind of fight for this number, or at least something close to it. We're going to, I think, need to continue to place negative weight somehow on controlling adult use size. Our fine wool flocks, in many cases, have animals with really solid, big yearling weights. Those translate into really big adult weights. And unless you're in a very good production environment, I think we have to start thinking about that. So here's a starting point that we might use for evaluating the dual purpose flocks that produce fine wools and meat. I should back up and acknowledge that Targi producers also compare, care about fine wools. I didn't want to imply you didn't. But Targi has a niche for their fleeces that is more a matter of balancing and producing an intermediate optimum fiber diameter than pushing for exceptional fine wools. We're going to have to reevaluate the relative importance of fleece weight and fiber diameter. We're going to have to think about which of the OFTA traits should be in the breeding objective. We're going to have to reconsider the relative importance of post weaning weight and yearling weight relative to fleece characteristics. It's going to be an exciting challenge and one I think everyone is looking forward to, though with a little trepidation. So in summary, EBVs work. If you use your EBVs in your selection program, genetic change will occur. We've got plenty of people who can document that for you. Some traits like birth weight, like ultrasonic fat, like ultrasonic muscle depth, deserve emphasis only when there's an opportunity, a chance to get premium prices, or a problem. Discounts on your lambs. Otherwise, we should continue to place primary emphasis on the traits with more clearly documented economic importance. Early growth, post-weaning growth, numbers of lambs born and weaned, maternal ability, fleece weights, fiber diameters. These are the core economically important traits. Being proactive is good if you really believe that the future lies with increasing muscle depths, if you really believe that the future lies in superfine fleeces, go for it, but it requires some guesswork. You've got to take a deep breath. You've got to move forward with the idea that you're right. Two things I would really emphasize as we close up. Optimizing number of lambs born and number of lambs weaned is important maybe one of the most important things you can do, and EBVs can help you do that. And controlling increases in use size is important in everywhere but the terminal sire breeds, and maybe there too. And EBVs for early and late weights may be the only way 
you're going to do that effectively. Good indexes are increasingly necessary to use EBVs. Our intuition won't always take us where they need to go. They need to be done right. They need to have a sound economic basis. And if that's done right, your customers will thank you for it. Okay, I've gone over a few minutes, Jay. Let's switch off to the questions and see what the audience has to say. Okay, excellent, Dave. Thank you very much for the presentation. I uh, had a lot of questions coming in, and I'm going to try to filter through them. And we have a couple of people with their hands up, and I'll get to those in a moment. Uh, first of all, uh, a quick one uh, from a boar goat person. They asked, can this be applied to boar goats? Yes, absolutely can. Uh, we did EBVs for boar goats uh, for two or three years. Oh, five, six, eight years ago. Uh, everything we do in terms of growth, muscle, you productivity, and potentially fecal egg counts and parasite resistance can be applied to boar goats, and boar goat breeders can sign up anytime they want to. We are ready for meat goat genetic evaluation. Okay, very good. And we had uh, somebody ask a question about, does birth weight vary by breed as far as survivability? Good question. And there are differing opinions and differing data about that. One of the, my basic answer, I guess, would be that birth weight and survivability is a greater issue in prolific breeds. Fins, polys, more likely to produce triplets and quadruplets. They're going to suffer from being too light. Uh, heavy birth weights can happen in breeds like Suffolk and Hampshire and Texel. We get plenty of 22, 23 pound birth weights in our Suffolk database. But if the ewes are having twins and if the ewes are pretty good mothers, we don't see convincing sire differences in lamb survival across all environments. We do see some suggestions that Suffolk sired lambs may have some difficulty in high prolificacy flocks and in new lambs. But in our Dubois work at the U.S. Sheep Experiment Station, our Suffolk sired lambs had no greater death losses than our Texels, Columbias, or Composites. Okay, very good. We have several people with their hands up, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, ask Paul Lewis. You got your hand up. I'm going to unmute your microphone, Paul. And uh, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, go ahead. Uh, actually, uh, you answered my question on there. I put my hand up and then I typed it in, uh, so I didn't know you were going to call on people. Okay. Excellent. Did, did you have any other questions? <laughs> that oh, I've, I've, got, I've got plenty, but uh, I'll talk to Dave later. You did a good job, Dave. Okay. Yeah, I was about ready to say, you've actually given Paul Lewis this opportunity. I couldn't imagine that you would have done that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, thank you. Um, Leslie Raber also has had her hand up for some time. Leslie, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Are you there, Leslie? I am, but that was an error, so we okay. can just pass on that. All right, thank you. And the other hand that we had up was from Mark Romke. Mark, are you there? Hello, Mark. Okay, I guess he's not there. Okay. Well, you guys can raise your hand and ask a question if you like. Uh, the microphones do work. Let me go back to the list we have here because we have plenty of them to choose from. A uh, question from out west, and I've actually wondered this myself. <laughs> when you get to these indexes and survivability, how do you account for predator losses? Okay, that's a great question. And if some of you would have been noticing that when we moved from the U productivity indexes to the Western Range Index, our measure of prolificacy switched from number of lambs weaned to number of lambs born. And the Targi breeders in particular, when we did the Western Range Index, said our number of lambs weaned is so influenced by predation that we prefer to use number of lambs born as our main indicator of reproductive capacity. So, so that was our solution there. When the bulk of your lamb losses 
come from predation, which is has no genetic basis in the sheep, uh, we we tend to step back and use the number of lambs born as the only indicator of prolificacy we have. Okay, very good. And uh, another question was, uh, is the antagonistic correlation between PEMD and PWWT being monitored in each breed? It's been looked at in several of the breeds. Uh, at, at this point in time, we have enough data to estimate those parameters well in the, the terminal breeds, predominantly the Suffolk. Uh, where it is the largest antagonism. The Australian breeds, it's not as antagonistic. We have a big chunk of data from Siremax. We have a big chunk of data from Targi. We just have not had a chance to go through it. I believe part of what we're seeing, and this is strictly my opinion, is that selection for extreme frame size and height in the Suffolk breed prior to NSIP has accentuated that antagonism, but that's just my opinion. Okay, rather long question here, but I'll go ahead and read it to you. At what point does emphasis on growth in terminal sires and emphasis on moderating mature size in maternal breeds create a size disparity between terminal and maternal breeds that is not practical? What resources are available to commercial producers to choose the optimal size for both terminal sires and maternal ewes? Okay, again, it's a great question. Um, with the exception of ewe lambs, and I think one always has to look at this very carefully in ewe lambs, and it's a time where you may need to look at even the breed of sire you choose to use on your ewe lambs. Uh, all I can tell you objectively is when we did the experiment at the, sheep exp at the U.S. Sheep Experiment Station uh, starting in 2006, ending in 2008, we brought rams in that had all the growth we could find in the Suffolk and Columbia breeds. We used those on a solid but certainly not extremely large set of Rambouillet range ewes, uh, two years old and up and we had no meaningful levels of lambing difficulty. Now we're about to repeat a similar experiment using 2015 model Suffolk rams, the biggest ones we can find, or the highest growth ones we can find. We will see. We're also using them on Polype, Targi, and Rambouillet ewes. Uh, it's the only way I know to do that is to check it and see. But I think that our current Suffolk rams on typical poly and western whiteface ewes are probably still okay, uh, but one needs to pay attention. Okay. Very good. Um, I had a question here on uh, if I can find it. Do you have a correlation between triplet survival and ewe weight? Not per se, no. Uh, no, I don't. Uh, I would guess if there is a correlation, it's if, if it's not near zero, it's probably positive because a big U probably does give a little more milk for a baby lamb. Uh, so there may be a little bit of advantage in a big U keeping a triplet alive but I think there are enough disadvantages that's not going to be a deal breaker or okay. a deal maker. And somebody asked, will we ever have a stability EBV? I don't know. Uh, as most of you know, we have kind of taken some of our research and development capacity uh, out of our own hands when we went to land plan. Uh, we have to do a much better better job of reporting you culling to do that. And I think that's one of those things that if that were to bubble up out of the NSIP users, we could probably make it happen. But I think to make it happen, it's going to have to bubble up out of some users who really want it to happen. Okay. We have a uh, couple of questions on where to find some information. Uh, one of them says, can we get the heritabilities used for each trait for each breed type in the NSIP analysis? 
I don't know if I can point you to a place that will have those, although we certainly could put them on the uh, NSIP website. They're not there right now, uh, but they're, they're not secrets, and we could certainly, uh, are there are enough people on this uh, call who would will remind me if we want to do that, we can, we can put those on the NSIP website. Okay. And another one was, where do we find the EP index, specifically for Dorsets, but in general, the prolificity? Well, the, the EP index is applied for Targi and uh, Katahdin, or for the maternal U, uh, Katahdin. The EP index is, is on a fact sheet on EPDs on the NSIP website. So there is a, a, a fact sheet on the NSIP website that describes each of the EBVs and includes the indexes uh, on it. Okay. Um, and then the, a question came in when you were talking about, uh, you know, the, the weights and the growth factors in there. Um, and it had to do with whether or not some of those numbers would make a difference in, in the value if we were marketing on a grid versus just live weights. The not much, frankly. Um, and if if you are if you are using terminal sires, and we were able to actually ask this question at Dubois at the sheep station data, if you're using terminal sires, and if you're marketing at weights between 120 and 150 pounds. Most of those lambs have the potential to be yield grade twos and threes if they're marketed at a proper weight. Uh, we had, using the grids we had available on 450 weather lambs uh, produced at the sheep station, 70% of those lambs hit the optimum grid cell if simply marketed on body weight. So unless you're dealing with marketing uh, smaller frame breeds as purebreds, it isn't going to change very much. The emphasis on leanness, you know, if you were marketing, I'll decide, I've got to decide who I want to pick on. Uh, let's pick on pollies. If I've got a flock of purebred poly commercial sheep and I want to sell them at 140 pound harvest weight, uh, I may need to put some emphasis on increasing leanness, but I'm not sure the emphasis required to make that lamb work would not have too many negative effects on you productivity. It's the great debate we have about how we produce market lambs. Yeah. And along those lines, somebody asked, is, is it being considered on a terminal sire index to use fat depth to ensure lambs are both fat enough but not too fat in an ideal market? No. <laughs> okay. I, would, I would say that no one is placing positive emphasis, especially in the terminal breeds, on fat depth. I think we're probably uh, pretty much ignoring fat depth in the terminal breeds because it's not perceived as a problem. It's interesting, though, the merino breeders in Australia, who would be the largest single group of sheep producers in that program, are seriously talking about placing positive emphasis on fat in the merino breed for just the reason, for, for a reason of being able to increase the resilience and the fitness of those ewes. So there's a very serious conversation about should we place positive emphasis on fat in this maternal breed that often functions in pretty tough environments, even though it will reduce carcass value? Yeah. Speaking of tough environments, a follow-up question to the predation question, and that is how do we equalize EBVs between flocks that have vast nutritional differences on their different rangelands? It's difficult. Uh, we, can, we can adjust for just straight scale differences. I mean, if woman's weaning 80 pound lambs and someone's weaning 40 pound lambs, some of that is adjusted for in the EBVs. But the assumption is that the lambs that grow in the flock producing 80 pound lambs are genetically the same lambs that would grow in the flock producing 40 pound lambs. And we know that's too simple. 
uh, we don't do a good job of that. Uh, if we have large numbers of flocks in each production environment, we would encourage those breeders to work with one another to develop indexes that are right for their production environment. Just as Katahdin breeders in the deep southeast are going to have fecal egg count in their breeding objective, Katahdin breeders in the northern Midwest may not at all. So you don't know, and this is this is one of the real fallacies about indexes and breeding evaluate breeding objectives. And I'm glad you folks mentioned it. There is no reason that the whole breed should do the same thing. It's not necessary, and in many cases, it's not good. Indexes are great because they allow groups of breeders with similar views of the industry and similar production goals to work together to increase the effective size of their flock. And 10 flocks of 100 ewes each trying to do much the same thing will make a lot more genetic progress than one flock of 100 ewes trying to do the same thing. But if you are in an environment where your breeding goals, the things you need your sheep to do, don't match the things that people need their sheep to do in the east, then you and breeders like you need to get together and work out a set of EBVs that are appropriate for your sheep in your production environment. The last thing NSIP wants to do is to tell breeders what to do. We want to provide them with a tool, the EBVs, that will allow them to meet their breeding goals. And we want to do things like tonight, which provide some assistance in conceptualizing and implementing your breeding goals. But your breeding goals are yours. And if we didn't have people who go off on what we considered tangents 10 or 15 years ago, we wouldn't have some of the sheep we have today and that we need today. Well, that's, I know that's a deep topic and, and one where there's a lot of misunderstanding, I guess, with NSIP. Uh, one of the questions related to that was, has there been a discussion to make software available that enable producers to calculate their own economic weights for traits and therefore their own custom indexes? That has been tried at different times in different places. The Australians had some software uh, developed first for cattle and extended to sheep that did allow that. Uh, we've talked about whether we can do that. We, uh, we've talked about whether that's, uh, you know, one of the, one of the things in like this program that Let's Grow has some opportunities to help us do. Uh, we need the people to make it done, to get it done. Uh, we have to be a little bit careful. You remember those terminal sire indexes. We thought we were doing three or four different indexes, and the genetic correlation between all of them was 90, 95%. So we have to have somebody kind of helping us understand if what seemed like a good idea or a different take on something really works. So I don't want to discourage people from building their own indexes. But we need some really good guidance, and we aren't in a position to produce customized indexes right now. We have a listener that asked about scrotal measurement. Um, yep. They didn't recall you mentioning that in your talk. And right. I uh, had that on the screen. I just didn't take the time to talk about it. The rationale is the rams who have large testicles, especially relatively early in life, four, five, six, seven, eight months of age, those are rams that reach puberty earlier. Their siblings and daughters will likely reach puberty earlier. And by reaching puberty earlier, they will likely be better mothers at first and second lambing at least. So measures of scrotal circumference in growing ram lambs is to some extent providing information on the reproductive ability of their daughters and female relatives. Probably most important in late maturing breeds, like maybe Rambouillet and Columbia, probably less important in early maturing breeds like Polype, where a lot of the ewe lambs are going to be cycling in plenty of time to lamb at 12 months of age anyway. So it's a useful 
supplemental measurement that tells you something about the probable reproductive ability of that ram's female relatives. Yeah, very good. We have time for just one more question here, and it has to do with lambing malpresentations. Is that heritable? And they specifically refer to lamb plan sending back lamb ease, and it gives malpresentations a worse score. I can't give you a great answer to that because I don't know. I'll give you my best take on it is that the different lambing difficulty events that go into the lambing ease score have been tried to be categorized from no problems at all to some of the worst things you can think about. And three lambs all tangled up and coming with the wrong end first is one of the worst things you can think about and that's probably the worst score. Whether presentation per se has a genetic component, I would be very skeptical. Most problems with lambing ease that involve lambs getting tangled up is just the price of doing business with twins and triplets, in my opinion. Okay. I can't give you a reference that will document that. Okay. Well, I lied. I do have one more quick question for you that sure. came in. It's a follow-up to the scrotal circumference question. It was, is there any correlation between muscle depth and scrotal circumference? Whoa, that's an interesting one. Um, I suspect there's a little bit of a positive association because lambs that have good muscle depth when adjusted to a standard harvest weight tend to be a little thicker, shorter, earlier maturing sheep, and I wouldn't be at all surprised they have a little bit larger scrotal circumference. But part of that is just sort of the geometry of sheep, big ones, little ones, long legs, short legs. I think that's maybe what we're seeing rather than what I would call a, a really functional relationship. There's a lot of concern about, and I know we're trying to get at this turned off, but there is a lot of concern about whether adjusting uh, to a constant body weight when we slaughter sheep across a tremendously wide range of body weights is the right thing to do. In the United States, we've always adjusted our scans to a constant animal weight. The Australians adjust their scans to a constant weight. The Brits adjust their scans to a constant age. They say if a sheep is big and therefore has a big loin muscle, that's still a big loin muscle. We're going to give that animal credit for that. We tend to take away the big loin muscle that's associated with just being a big sheep. And that's a, a wonderful argument to indulge in over quite a lot of beer some evening. But that's probably as far as we'll get with it tonight. <laughs> okay, very good. And and thank you uh, to the listeners who sent in so many questions. Sorry I couldn't get to them all this evening. And and uh, obviously, Dave, you touched on a, a chord that everybody's interested in there with your presentation. I really appreciate you taking the time tonight to, to make the presentation and doing such a fine job on it. My pleasure. I'm glad we had a lot of people here, and I, I suspect a lot of these things will have other opportunities to be talked about, which is great in more depth and with more focus groups of breeders. Uh, the idea was a pretty broad brush tonight, so I'm sure everyone felt a little cheated, but hopefully everyone got some ideas they think they can take home, too. Very good. And and uh, in mention of other, other opportunities, we have another webinar coming up next month. Uh, on September 22nd, that'll, that's a Tuesday. It'll be at this, this uh, same time, uh, 7 p.m. Central and 8 p.m. Eastern. Uh, our presenter will be Dr. Bob Von Zahn of Penn State University, and the title of his talk will be Dietary Supplements, a Necessity or Folly. So we encourage you to join us for that. I should have the uh, invitation out to uh, register for that uh, webinar this coming Thursday. Once again, it will be on September 22nd, uh, Tuesday night at the same time. And uh, we want to uh, end by thanking the uh, Let's Grow Committee and the American Sheep Industry Association for providing funding for these programs. Uh, we really appreciate their support, and we invite all our listeners to visit their website at www.sheepusa.org. 
uh, with that, this is Jay Parsons bidding everybody a good evening, and uh, we'll see you next time.